I admit, I have to say, I admit I'm being, uh, uh, you're not saying this, but I am and it's interfering this with the thing. I'm getting a notice that the meeting is being live streamed. Um, I should say I'm slightly more nervous than usual. So I remember Millens uh, was, of course, my advisor. Um, and I remember in one of the first conferences that we went to together, I think it was my second year or third year, Millen was going to go up and present and give a talk. And, is, you know, he's nervous before his talk. And I, you know, he's my advisor. He shouldn't be nervous. So I said, you know, are you nervous before you're giving a talk? He said, yeah. If I ever stop being nervous, that's when you know things are going badly. <laughs> so, and I actually, you know, that's one uh, lesson. And I, I appreciate that lesson. And I still get very nervous before I give talks. Um, what I had made was a mistake, not only of giving a talk, though, you know, you get more nervous when your advisor is watching you. <laughs> so I can report to you now, I've empirically tested, and 25 years later, you still get nervous when your advisor is watching you. And I've made a mistake of actually sending the link Zoom to my students at my group, because I'm actually giving this talk is a little bit of an overview of what we've been doing for about 10 years now in a particular topic, um, which is swarms. So now my students are also watching this. So I feel like I'm getting doubly nervous from everything. So please excuse me if I ramble on for a little bit. Anyways, so the title of my talk is Diverse Swarms, uh, Better Swarms. And it's really gonna touch on three different issues. Each one of them is an independent research topic that I've worked on with um, my students and that we've made concrete advancements in and technical conditions and publications and so forth. But in this talk, I'm actually gonna just touch these, I'm going to touch the results, but I'm actually going to draw, try to draw your attention to something else that's going on from having done this for 10 years in very different domains of research that all have swarms in them. And the point I'm trying to draw it is actually that there's something interesting going on when you're thinking about swarms, not as being homogeneous, which is the common assumption that's usually made in swarm robotics and in swarm agents, um, but you actually look at them as being diverse. And I don't have a, a great bottom line result that shows you that this is, you know, the role of diversity is exactly X times the whatever. And, you know, this is how, this is not what I'm trying to point out. What I'm trying to point out is that you put, start putting these results together in very, very different domains. I go all the way in this talk from human crowds to molecular robots that are actually, each one of them is smaller than a COVID virus. And there is something interesting that happens because they're diverse, not because they're homogeneous. In fact, they become much more potent, okay? And this is what I would like you to have in mind uh, as, I, as I give this talk, and I guess we think about after I'm done. So Alan Newell, who was one of the co-founders of AI and is my academic grandfather, um, was known for saying that you don't choose the scientific problem, the scientific problem chooses you. And I've been following the same scientific problem, slightly different phrased over the years, but it, believe me, it's very consistent and it's always the same one ever since I started, co-founded Millen's group uh, when, uh, so, so many years ago. And it says, how does the one mind become part of the many? What are the general mechanisms that we have that allow an individual mind to now reason about and interact with and manipulate others and learn from others this is how we come, well, what is it, or the mechanism that allow a more single mind to become part collective, okay? And this is my scientific problem and I'll solve it or I'll drop that. One of these two things might happen first, okay? For many years, what I've been doing is trying to work on teams, which was a particular type of collective where agents and robots have joint goals and can interact globally. That is, they can interact with each other essentially freely. Okay, and so these are some pictures from um, previous work that I've done in my lab with the best soccer team in Israel ever in the history of the state. I'm including human soccer teams in it too. Okay, we've reached the world finals, the World Cup finals three times, which is more than you can say about the other soccer team in Israel. Plus, they sit, they all live in between games. They live in, in a shelf, so they're very economical. This is some work we've done on getting teams of robots to maintain shape as they go. Uh, this is work that was later commercialized on patrolling fences and has been actually been uh, commercialized and used. This is, uh, these are pictures from, this is my company, uh, which has gone public uh, about two years ago, which sells robots and drones for cleaning solar panels. And I know I'm showing you only the single robot, but the, the original direction 
was actually for drones to pick up the robots and move them between rows. So it also involved a lot of teamwork. And these are all things that are that have been happening for essentially for the last 20 years or so. And the last 15 years, over time, me and many others who have been working in multi-robot systems have had a lot of success in getting multi-robot systems out, out from academia and actually impacting the real world. So you could see that very early on with uh, Akiva uh, Systems, which turned into and actually started uh, Amazon Robotics, was acquired by uh, Amazon and became Amazon Robotics, which have completely changed the way warehouse are being handled and automated uh, today. Uh, delivery robots, we see, keep seeing these experiments, but they're becoming more and more persistent. Delivery drones, we keep hearing about how they're coming. I think the uh, ground vehicles are going to get their first. Uh, slower but sure. It's a motto that works really well when you're thinking about drones versus ground vehicles. Uh, cleaning, all of these things are changing and they're fun. They're changing actually the way we do, uh, we live in more fundamental ways than we can think about than we actually give them credit for. Okay, so these are successes of multi robot teams. And in all of them, it really is teams. So the, the idea is that the robots can really interact at the global level. And typically they do this by cheating. So the commercial, if you look closely at commercial, uh, applications and not at the technology that sort of led to the rise of this. A lot of the technologies that we developed in academia are intended for fully distributed teams. What's really happening in the commercial world when these things are taken out to the field is that they're actually not fully distributed, they're hybrids. They're getting a little bit of centralized, typically it's centralized planning and distributed execution, or, you know, for example, in, in the warehouses, it's typically a single, you know, a server that gets the orders and directs the robot. They tell each robot to go to pick up what, but it, they don't tell them necessarily the way because the actual layout changes. And so they individ individually, they do their own path planning or at least uh, obstacle avoidance. So there's a mixture of distributed and centralized uh, technologies that are taking place. And the reason you can't really go fully distributed is because, well, the company will tell you it costs too much or it's not necessary for the cost that they can provide it. But another way of thinking about it is actually there's something which I refer to informally as an interaction bandwidth. So there's a limited ability for all the agents, all the robots in the group, in the collective to actually be able to reach decisions together. And thank God in some of these situations, they don't need to because there's a centralized machine that actually tells them. So that actually organizes everything. And so they don't need to vote or, or make this joint decisions in the distributed fashion that we'd like to explore in academia. And so it works quite well. The problem is, and you know, for many years I've kind of avoided this issue, but the problem is that this doesn't always work. So there are applications and there are areas of interest and exploration where you can't, you can no longer cheat. And while everything was going on in teamwork and was going fine, you know, I thought maybe I don't have to avoid this issue, but every, in the last 10 years or so, ever since I started working on pedestrian crowds and I'll show them some of the work, that, you know, I could no longer avoid the issue. So I, you know, I really wanted to remain very grounded in the, you know, empiricism, in the fact that these issues would come up and then I deal with them. I don't want to deal with issues before I have to, but these issues started coming up. And I'll just give you two examples where I think we not only, you know, it's not only me, but all of us will have to start thinking about how these issues come up. One of them is using robots as models for life. So when we're using, we're trying to actually simulate crowd and understand how crowds operate. We're not interested in just generating the motion. This is what the computer graphics do. And if you go to movies, you'll see fancy orcs charge the castle en masse. And it looks like a perfect swarm, but really nobody actually cares if they really are thinking like orcs because we don't know what orcs think like anyways. But if you're trying to actually get an understanding of how human crowds operate, because you're trying to train somebody to work with these human crowds, it's really critical that you understand how they are acting individually. If you're doing a project like I'm doing right now, trying to understand locusts, we have, this is in my lab, unfortunately, because I couldn't get the biologists to agree to bring the robots to them before they're ready. So these are locusts. If you're seeing them through the screen, they look much more ugly without the screen. So this is really the, you know, the fuzzed picture is actually better. Um, and you have these robots and they're acting together within an arena because we're trying to find out how locusts work. I mean, that's, and I'm trying to get inspired by the locusts to find out how I can make the robots work. But from the biology perspective, the robots here are a model for what the locust acts like and makes decision like. What does, well, how do they work? And you can't cheat because that's exactly 
against what you're trying to do. You're trying to do understand how they're doing it in a distributed fashion. And this is already raising some questions about what we've been assuming in swarm robotics. Okay, here's another example. These are molecular robots and I'll talk about them later on. And they're intended for targeted drug delivery. And any notion that these things will ever be able to communicate when they're in that scale, this is 50 nanom uh, nanometers. So just, you know, the flu is about 70 or 80 nanometers, the flu virus, okay? These are small, really small, okay? And these things, you can't have, a, you can't make any kind of cheating assumption where you're saying, well, this nanoparticle and this nanoparticle that's gonna be somewhere in my leg and somewhere near my heart or in my legs are gonna be able to communicate somehow. It's not gonna happen, not in any kind of fashion. You can't really plan out their path for them in the same sense that we're thinking about this because they're just gonna go in the bloodstream all across your body. I mean, it's just, they're just gonna circulate there. So these things, you can no longer think about cheating. You have to start thinking about it as really as swarm. The interaction bandwidth is going to be restricted to the point where you can no longer assume that it can't, that we can find some way around it. And this is really what I'm trying to get to in the, when I think about swarms. When you were thinking about teams, and I know a lot of people know this, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm just going to get everybody in sync. We can think about robots interacting globally at the group level, okay, and they have joint goals, which then they negotiate and they can do a better job at it or a worse job at it. But what we're trying to do is achieve this together by communicating or coordinating each other. But when you're talking about swarms, the agents inherently have to do only local interactions. They can only interact in small clusters in small groups. And you kind of hope that something nice emerges as the deployer, you're kind of hoping that something nice emerges uh, from their own group. But they have essentially their own goals, not because they're not, you know, they're selfish, but because they just don't know. They don't know what everybody else is doing. They barely know what people, you know, the robots around them are doing or the agents around them are doing. And so we can think about them as having their own goals simply from the fact that they're not aware of the global goal and how it's how it's behaving or how it's achieving. Okay. So in swarms, all the global behaviors really emerge from these local interactions that can happen in parallel, in small, in, in clusters. There'll be one set of robots interacting in one side, another set of robots interacting on that side. And if you're thinking about nanobots, this is gonna happen on trillions of robots interacting in very, very small groups with each other all in simultaneously. And they, uh, what we're trying to get is some sort of a global phenomenon emerging, okay? So uh, just to give you a sense, I'm not the first person obviously to think about swarms. A lot of people are interested in swarms, have been for many years in robotics, in science, and you know, other areas of science, really in biology, um, in agents, there are a lot of swarming phenomena, okay? But essentially all of it has always made the assumption that the swarm is homogeneous. Everybody's the same and they get the same set of rules and they have the same set of capabilities and the local interactions, that, the variations that we're seeing, the interesting behavior that we're seeing is, is, is caused because we're, they're not meeting each other at exactly the right time in the, in the they're not in lockstep stop lockstep they're not meeting each other exactly when the same rules are applied everywhere they're meeting each other when this one agent is in one part of their rules or its algorithm and another agent is in a different part of the algorithm but had they met had they interacted under the exact same settings the two agents would have just reversed their roles so they're not changing anything in the agent itself the agents themselves are fixed and are homogeneous. And one example, this is very powerful. This is not a overly restrictive assumption. It was made for a reason. It simplifies the rules and it allows us to, to get into the investigation. So this is, here's an example of uh, lanes forming in pedestrian traffic. This is a phenomenon that's been well-documented by anthropologists um, for many, many years. And it turns out that you can actually simulate it very nicely by following just, just these three rules, one, one of which is a go-to. So, you know, we don't really count it, right? The, the, set, the, the rule is you go forward until you can't. And if you can't, you switch either to your right or your left randomly. And then you try again. So what happens? You have robots or agents that are meeting each other. They randomly select. Sometimes they would randomly go to the same thing, but you know, there's only so many such and such probability of this happening. So, you know, they will eventually do this, and then they will continue. Now, since they never change course 
I'm, the first rule just says go forward. Over time, what happens is that everybody falls into a lane and just follows each other, right? And you will see these lanes forming. And that's exact match for what we're seeing in nature in human crowds, okay? Supposedly. But that's good enough. And for many years, that's, that, you know, that's the base model that you compare against. We're going to beat that model later on in this talk. But I'm just showing you how a very simple homogeneous set of rules for, I'm sorry, the set of rules is not homogeneous. The swarm is homogeneous. Actually works well to explain what we're seeing and achieves a what would be otherwise a very interesting phenomenon. Okay, so where did it go? Okay, so in this talk, what I want to talk about, I'm going to mention three different areas of research, uh, pieces of research that we've done, and in each one of them, what I'll try to highlight is the fact that we actually avoided that assumption. We're moving away from homogeneous uh, assumptions about the swarm into thinking that maybe the swarm itself is varied, that is, it's diverse. It has agents that are varied between themselves in capabilities and in their decision-making. And the behavior that you get is not only a situation of having them in different settings, but also in the same settings, two different agents would actually make different decisions or we would be capable of different things. And this is what we're trying to get. So the first piece is, um, is going to be about pedestrians. And then I'll talk a little, a little bit about um, Reinforcement learning, in fact, a model that we call swarming bandits. And you, I think you'll appreciate um, that given the Millen's latest interest in, uh, in uh, multi-armed bandits. And then I'll talk about re recreating Asimov's laws in molecular robots. So this is the first part of the work. It was a work that was carried out with a former PhD student, Natalie Friedman, who's very talented. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I nicknamed it swarming psychologist, but it really is, was completely inspired by psychology. When the time when we started this, we were opposed to this idea of the model. It's a very simple model that was put up. It was the prevalent model in doing pedestrian crowd simulation. And it just really bugged me that we were looking at uh, humans as if they were particles. And the model is inspired by particle physics. And it, I, I'm just sorry. I just think we're a little bit more complicated than that. And it bugged me that we are not seeing that complication of that complexity being translated into, um, into the, uh, the algorithm that we were writing. So pedestrian simulations are interesting in, its, in themselves because they actually have a lot of impact on how you plan buildings and architecture and you plan streets, um, how you do evacuations and so how you train people, uh, security personnel, and you can evaluate what, what will happen under certain kind of contingencies. And of course, for you know, if you're thinking about entertainment, you always need urban noise for streets and so forth. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that is of interest and has a lot of literature on it by itself. And then I've told you already about the standard pedestrian models and there are various variations around them, but they're all focusing, they're all around this idea of particle physics. So all the people are particles, they get influenced by forces. And this is, there's no consideration of their own inner attributes, their own inner beliefs, um, age, uh, groupings, family orientship, uh, gender, all of these are get ignored, culture gets ignored in all of these models. So we wanted to tackle this. And the entry point was through uh, Leon Festinger's social comparison theory. Leon Festinger is um, a social psychologist, was, I think a lot of people recognize uh, his work for the other big thing he did other than social comparison. He also coined the term uh, cognitive dissonance, um, which a lot of people now recognize, but this was a, a slightly over, he did that in 57. In 54, he did the work on social comparisons there. And this is still actively researched. Um, and the one thing about uh, Festinger's paper is that it's really written down in axiomatic form. So he says, you know, here are the axioms by which people work. And then he shows or theorizes that how these axioms come into play. And essentially there are these three rules, okay, for how people supposedly make decisions when it comes to um, uh, evalu evaluating their own progress within social settings. If they find out, or if they feel that they're not making enough progress and they need some external judgment, then that's a whole question in itself. They will do the following three things. They will compare their opinions. That's in the original writings. Our agents don't have opinions, but, um, and I'm a little bit worried about the point where they start arguing back. So I'm, I'm glad with this. Um, they compare their opinions to those that are similar, okay? They take actions to reduce the differences, but the tendency to make those 
to reduce those differences and the taking the tendency to make the comparison grows less with uh, uh, dissimilarity. So the more I'm similar, the more I'm attracted. But on the other end, there's a filter. If you're too similar, I'm going to be avoiding you. And you can kind of mentally think about it. It's a little bit like the three zone models that exist for swarm robotics. And if you don't know what it is, it's fine. I mean, this is not a, this is not a test, um, but it does strike a chord. I think it's a textual description of later on what we've seen happening in, and reinvented in computer graphics and in swarm robotics, uh, looking at the same thing. And the, we had, we started the research with the hypothesis that social comparison is a general mechanism for how the human uh, social mind works. And I'm still pursuing that assumption. As I told you, my ultimate goal is actually to understand how one mind becomes the many. This is, I think, a general mechanism. But I'm not here to talk about the generality of the mechanism. I'm talking about taking that and actually applying it to, um, uh, to pedestrian simulation. So this is not, of course, the actual algorithm that was written. I'm trying to put it, simplify it into the, the, the um, into steps that we can we can go over very briefly and and understand. So the 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 way the algorithm was working, you know, the agents would run through this algorithm repeatedly. It would be the decision making loop, right? They're selecting an agents that are not too similar and not too dissimilar. Where these things would actually be a function, you know, they would have a comparison function and you put weight, weights and, and limits on that function so that you get a, you narrow down your comparison group. And of those, you select the maximally similar agents and then you take actions to, um, you compute an action that you can take to reduce that difference. And in fact, you can, we've talked about the power of attraction. So given the tendency to make more of that action or, you know, it's a gain on the action, right? Do I increase the speed to uh, get closer? Um, or do I just, uh, and to, to what extent do I increase the speed? So it's, if you think about it in terms of distances, say I want to be more similar to Milland, then I, the action is to gain speed because I have to minimize the distance. He's also walking or moving in some fashion. The beta factor would be the acceleration that I put in. How much do I really want to do this as quickly as possible, okay? And this is how the algorithm worked. And the agents, if you notice here, are looking at a multidimensional comparison. So they're not just looking, normally in swarm robotics, we would just be looking at distances, maybe headings. Here, we allowed for the comparison to also know things like the, you know, what this is a pedestrian simulation, age, gender, okay? Cultural differences. We would talk, I would later talk about these, okay? So the comparison is really multi, multidimensional. And the function that takes into account, we used um, a sum of vector differences, but, and we've always wanted to test what happens if you go to the cosine similarity, which would be like in recommendation systems. But this is the general idea. You're comparing these two vectors that are, you know, that are representing the agents and you're trying to now find a, 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 an action that would reduce the difference. So we later on added to this when we started adding factors that change with uh, culture. So cultural aspects not only change the number of the dimensions or the dimensions that you compare, but also the actions and the weight given to those actions. So they change the nature of the comparison itself. So you can think about which side you prefer to pass on, overtake or, or avoid. That, that, that changes with cultures. That changes the type of actions that you, you look at. Um, how do I move within a group? In certain cultures, you would see families move together. In some cultures, you see more of a tendency for parents and children to be separate. Some other cultures, you see male and females working separately. This also happens. Um, there are certain group speeds. There's interpersonal distances that are changing between different cultures. All of these different things change. And so the nature of the comparison itself changes. In fact, you do more of a um, social comparison theory this is something I didn't mention before, but also talked about comparison upwards and comparison downwards. So you compare yourself against those that are like you and you try to disassociate from those that are unlike you, but you do this separately for those who are unlike you because you consider them to be superior and those that are unlike you because you consider them to be inferior. And there's a whole theme, you know, they, they later on go, he didn't do it, I think, but other researchers following up on social comparison then have a whole thing about why Mean, meaning uh, winning the silver medal is worse than getting the third place, the bronze, okay? Because the comparison upward and downward looks very different. Anyway, 
So just really quickly jumping into this thing, which we've shown taking this kind of algorithm and utilizing uh, uh, for simulations, we took movies in Paris and Vancouver. At some point, it became a joke in the group that uh, Natalie was getting free travel to all kinds of fancy places uh, just to photo, uh, just to video things. But uh, this is from Paris, I believe, and we we do our own side some uh, uh, movies from Vancouver and from Israel and other places. And then we would show pick people, you know, net logo pictures, which completely abstract away the 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 architecture. Right, it just shows the movie. And then we started asking questions, you know, on absolute fidelity, which is, you know, how close is any of these models? We compare different models, including, of course, the particle physics one. How do we, uh, how close is it to pedestrian movie? And so you could just score very low on any one of the models. It just don't look similar. Okay. And then we looked at relative fidelity, which was asking the question of, you know, if you had to choose between them, what would be the most similar and what would be the most dissimilar? Okay. And for all of these things, we've used ordinal scales. And here are some results, okay? So this is the SCP model with different variations. This is the particle physics model, okay? And the top result is better. This is an absolute fidelity. So this is a, a, a question where you could, any, any one of the models could have scored really well or could have scored really, uh, really badly, okay? And it does score well. We also asked a different question, which was out of these models, which one is the best, right? What is the model that is most similar to what you're seeing out of those that you're watching? And one model was the most dissimilar. And this just collects a histogram of the answers. So the most of the participants selected this model as being the most similar. And it was the second best at being uh, at, in terms of the number of people who thought it was uh, most dissimilar. Right, so this model is actually the most dissimilar, but this is close to it. Yes, sir. Can you elaborate a bit about how you measure similarity between the model and what you've We just let people qualitatively assess. They saw the movie and they saw the other movie and they could actually see selective different movies. They could watch as much as they want for an extended period of time. And we tried our best to, um, to put this approximately the same number of um, entities on the screen as you would see in the movie but we did not control for position you know we we only control for dense for essentially for density so if their movie the movie has a changing number of people in it right so you take sort of an average you say okay this is how many entities are going to be on the screen when i simulate this and then you just start them off and let them go yes sir which is more similar or not. What did they find as the factor for similarity? We did not. So we, we couldn't ask the people about uh, what they, when we're asking about similarity here, we're asking about similarity between reality and one of the models, okay? And we did not go in depth. This was a, just a, a course uh, uh, of, uh, of questions that had an ordinal scale. We did not go in depth about why they, they thought it was more similar. In retrospect, of course, that would have been a follow-up kind of a question that we should have asked. Uh, we did try all of these things. I, I'm not going to go into now, but they have meaning. I mean, we played around with different features, such as, you know, was the heading, for example, in principle, the model, you could get it to agents to kind of walk in somebody's direction that's coming in the opposite direction and then decide that they want to switch around because they felt that that would be the best action to take was to adopt the same heading as the other so these are different models where we played around with this and always we keep the baseline, which is the model that I've showed you before, okay? Um, so of course you could get it to be really bad, but um, we were pleasantly surprised, yes. So what do the N, O, G, G, C, P, etc. So this is uh, not adopting, this allows it to, um, uh, it plays no importance on the goal. So it would agree to change the heading. This does keep the goal but now I forget what C3 means, but it was a variant, I think, where um, it didn't include any uh, emphasis on grouping. So if you split, if you saw an obstacle, you would split around it instead of walking together, which most people actually do. Um, I mean, different things like that. There's a link to the paper later, and I'm happy to send it later. Um, I did want to also mention that we did a second follow-up with the culture where we actually took webcam data from different countries 
and now try to see where we could adjust for, oh, sorry, you had a question? Yeah, uh, a quick question. So do you also consider the starting and end points of each of the, um, like entities? And again, a lot of pattern would depend on where we start. Yeah, so we again the we can't the move the human movement was just there, right? And so we had a few minutes of that, about five or six minutes. And of course, the humans don't go around and do this again. These are just natural pedestrians. So at the start of this, we would get the agents placed approximately in the same density, but they're not all starting at the bottom of the screen. In fact, they're already okay. distributed with the uh, pedestrian simulation. The what is normally done is you will let it go in it's an infinite corridor. Yes. So with the particle physics model, you have the benefit that it's a really simple rule. You don't have to tune anything and you just run it. Yeah. And you maybe end up with somebody that's something that's good enough. This gets definitely better results. But my question is how easy it is to figure out the features, how many features, what exactly to tune. And how easy was that for you? No, I, I agree. I, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely valid and, and very good question. It hinges on the premise that it's good enough. The question is, what is good enough? If you think this is absolute fidelity, this is an ordinal scale from one to three, from one to six, okay? Do you think three is good enough? I would say it's a mediocre result. Yes, we were able to tune the model and get it up to almost five. I would think that's better. Question is exactly, it's, ex, it's exactly the question of purpose, right? I mean, a long time we spent the, the, when we started this, I was not interested in swarm diversity. I was not even interested in swarms, right? So, but one of the problems that we had, one of the difficulties in explaining the research, which we overcame, but was against this backdrop of literature from computer graphics that had all these fancy, uh, crowd simulations that are absolutely astonishing to watch, okay? But the question is, what's the goal? Are you trying to make a movie? In which case, you know, if it makes sense, then that's fine. Or are you actually trying to model human beings? In which case, the way it looks is not a good measure of how good it is. The, I think the tipping point for me when I sort of was kind of slamming my head in the, into the wall and saying, this is not it, this is not it, was we were reading this paper about this computer graphics uh, group who was doing research and they were using their simulations to try to assess what was the size of the uh, Roman Coliseum and how many people it could house, it could sit. And, but they were doing this on models that were you know, done for computer graphics. There was no adjustment for how people actually behave. Now this is, it becomes dangerous at that point because this is now okay, it's a sort of historical thing but what's the next point? The next point is that you're actually trying to now run it on architectural models because you're trying to do safety assessments and it's based on the wrong models. So that's, I think, is the question when you're saying good enough, what it is, what is, what is good enough mean? And I think that's the critical point. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'll be here all day. You can ask me more questions. <laughs> so I just want to point out that we were able to then uh, adjust for culture, okay? We're adjusting micro level, making micro level adjustments to the individual algorithms and then measuring the overall global performance. And the result is that we can actually you now simulate fairly closely different pedestrians in different cultures. There's a graph I removed from this because it was just getting too much, but you can actually now, once you've got, you can, I can show you that I can actually simulate different pedestrians of different cultures based on the attunement that we've done. I can now start to simulate asking questions such as what happens if you've got so and so many people from France visiting so and so or walking together with so and so many people from Iraq or from Israel. And you really get different changes in this, but you, you know, based on this uh, data. And that, of course, this is one experiment I, would, I think I would be very interested in seeing somebody else perform where they're paying pedestrians to walk around from different cultures, flying them over and things like that. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we were able to really get, and, and just to, I really want to nail down the point, right? We're not attuning, seeing the end result in terms of the global feature. So there's flow here, we're measuring the flow, which is the, the, the speed uh, for the density. We really are tuning, you know, micro level, individual level things, such as the tendency to walk and the spatial differences, the spatial uh, uh, distances you would keep and seeing whether the result then matches 
what happened in that culture. Yes. yes. No, 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 not at all. That's exactly the point. So kids walk slower. They have, uh, sometimes they would run, but in general, they, for per stride, they make up for little distances. Um, men and women walk slow, different, different spaces. When Depending also members. on the group that they're in, there's a group motion that is generated. Uh, for us, it would be generated, synthesized from the model rather than uh, what up, but there is a tendency to walk slower or faster. Um, the interpersonal distances, of course, also dictate speed changes. If I get too close to something, I will slow down. And that distance at which this happens depends also on the culture. So um, there are a lot more details in the paper. Okay, I should I should move on to the next. But really, the the list. I think that the big lesson here is that taking making understanding that the comparison itself is complex. It's not a one two dimension thing. It's multiple dimensions. That there's and um, it's not a simple comparison, right? The action that you take actually has to be reasoned about. You have to select the action that you take, and you have a tendency to move to more or less of it. I think that's the critical one. So the agents have just become our uh, heterogeneous. Okay, so this is uh, different. This has been going on for many years with different students. So it's really not joint work, it's joint works at different times. Uh, it's an evolving model. And I'm just gonna talk about the latest one. But this really was looking at uh, swarm robotics. So I think some of you know that there's a canonical task for multi-robot systems people tend like to talk about when they do swarm, which is foraging. You have robots, they're all placed in an arena, they all have a base, they all come out of the base, pick up what we call as pucks, because when MIT first did it, they actually used hockey pucks for the robots to collect. So they go out, they select pucks, and they bring them home. Okay, and they do this individual level. And it's interesting because, of course, they collide into each other, and then there's always the decision of who gives in to whom in the robots, and do I, do I yield or do I go forward and things like that. Uh, from the point of view of the individual robot, the timeline really looks like this, right? It starts on its program task. It then gets too close and it needs to avoid the, the collision. So then it selects a resolution method. And over the years, that's why this is a canonical task. It just it was a, a very um, productive domain for generating lots of interest in collision avoidance methods. So you select the collision avoidance methods and then you look around this. So from the timeline perspective, this is what the life of a swarm robot looks like. And if it's foraging, then that's what it really does when it's undisturbed. And when it's something else, you know, P is a task that we don't touch. It's a black box, right? Now, there are many different collision methods, as I've um, talked about and I mentioned. I'm just going to um, convince you that there are enough of them where it became interesting to actually learn which one you use. So the initial work was really to start to do this offline. But then the part of the work that I'm talking about has gone from this, you know, up to now. Um, which is really doing online learning. So the robots are adjusting what they're doing, how they're responding to collisions as they're already being deployed and they're working. And the hope is that they get better at this, right? So this is, now the latest instantiation of our thinking about this is that this really should be thought about as a stochastic game, right? You put all these agents together and they start by performing a task and then they have to coordinate resolve it and then they go back to doing their task and then another conflict occurs so there's another collision so they have to resolve that and it'll take them different times to resolve it they, it doesn't get all resolved together they don't communicate between themselves i might yield then if i go back for me the collision is now taking a long time the other robot i've just yielded to it almost continues instantaneously so it will resolve the collision much faster than the other we still have are making here an assumption that everybody collides together which is not true in reality but that gets us closer to uh, where we want to go. Um, and it's already showing, you know, I'll show you some results and we'll see that empirically it's very successful. So this is an assumption that we still have to take care of, but it still is something that um, is already progress. So each one of these is really a stage game. And in, actually the instantiation which we hear is that we no longer make the assumption that each stage game is the same. So it's not a repeated game, but it is a, a stochastic game. But that was a, a previous assumption that we made. And if you look at it, what does the swarm want to do? So, you know, we put in these robots. They're not there because, uh, uh, because they actually have a will to be there and collect pucks. We're interested in, the, in getting the maximum number of pucks, okay? 
And um, the biologists are actually looking at differently, right? They're looking at the individual survival and maybe gene survival, but for us, let's stick with robotics. The roboticists are thinking about it as we want to maximize the number of pucks collected by the entire swarm. So we're looking at how much pucks are being collected by all the times in which I was in program mode, I was in task mode. So what I would then do is try to make sure that there's enough, that the speed, the time that I'm spending collecting pucks is maximized across the entire swarm. And for now, we're still assuming somebody else has built the program. So it could have done a terrible job of collecting pucks, but that's not, I can't solve that. Okay. In fact, I'm not going to show you the movie, but we have a movie where robots have learned to walk around because the puck collecting problem was terrible. Okay. They just circle around. They never collect pucks. Okay. But, um, if we assume that during that the, the monotonically increasing, really, we make the assumption here of chronology, but it's actually weaker than that, that the more time I give you or the, the swarm to be in program mode together, the more pucks are being collected, then that's better. Then this becomes maximizing the utility, actually it becomes maximizing the total time stem. So this is T is the number of stages and I N is the set of agents. So this is across all the agents some of all the program times for all the agents across all the stages of the game, okay? But this is, of course, I don't know T, this form wouldn't know T, it's an infinite horizon game. So we're really looking at the limit. Okay, so it's the limit of means. And then, of course, the robots can't measure what everybody else is doing. So from their perspective, this is what they're looking at, right? They're looking at individually, they're trying to maximize this. Now, this begins very much to look like a collection of multi-armed bandit games, right? So this is a multi-armed bandit problem for the first agent. This is a multi-armed bandit for the second agent. This is a multi-armed bandit for the third agent. P here hinges on the action that I've selected because that will determine how much time did I select an agent, uh, an avoidance action that's very short and so give me a lot of program time or did I select a, an avoidance action that was very long and maybe gave me a very, very little time until the next collision? From the agent's perspective, that's their selection problem. That's what they're trying to learn, how to maximize, how to select the right action that will maximize the program time. And they, since they don't know this, really only they have access to is this. But we're looking at the global. We're looking at the sum of these things. And so then it becomes an interesting, exactly, essentially, a, kind of a classic standard stochastic game problem. How do I select an action that doesn't reduce, right? That doesn't hurt the social welfare, which is what we're after, okay? Without knowing anything about what the others are doing, okay? So this is the problem. When I, I can select an action, that, for example, that would be always be resolved very, very quickly, okay? If I yield for just a few seconds, I just step out of the way, it will resolve the collision. It will probably, if everybody does this, will endlessly be yielding. Nothing will get done because it, so it shortens the time that you get until the next collision. If I'm very forceful, I could be pushing another robot directly into the end. We've actually seen cases like that. So it will take a long time, but maybe I'm clearing the way from, you know, I'm clearing the space, so I'm becoming it less dense. So then other robots can now play nicely um, and collect more pucks. We've seen cases of this. So the question is, how do you do this? And the answer that we uh, come up with is to actually try to align the individual and the group utilities by using what um, um, Wolpert and Kate and Khan called uh, the wonderful life utility, marginal contribution. So each one of the agents is trying to assess the difference. The actual reward that they're getting is not just their own um, time for having played after the last collision, but also the difference between that the total time, the total team utility with them, with their contribution, and the total team with the other, had they not hypothetically, counterfactually, not been around. And you can, you can express that in math in a sort of uh, fairly nice way. Um, but when you do that, then what happens is that if that gets used as the reward that you're collecting as for the, for the multi-armed bandits, is that all the agents are trying to now figure out how to maximize their marginal contribution rather than just really what their, their immediate reward for collecting uh, pucks or, or, sorry, for selecting this particular action. 
So that happens and you actually maximize the total. And it turns out that even though you don't know what the contribution of the entire swarm would be without you, you can kind of approximate it. And the way we do that is actually we look at the average contributions that we've made in the path and we make an assumption that other agents are like me uh, if they select the same action. And so uh, we can use that. And I'm, I'm again, not going into the math, but this is the type of experiments we've been running with this. These are, these are with the actual robots. We also have lots of simulation experiments. What you're seeing here are robots moving around and every day they collect the puck, they switch to blue when they um, uh, collide they'll switch to red and then they have to do avoidance. And uh, again, just showing you a very small subset of results, okay? The way to read this graph, so first of all, I've highlighted what's best. And if you would guess that it's ours, ours. But here's what I'm really trying to point out because this is a talk about diversity. The y-axis measures the number of pucks that the team was able to collect in a fixed amount of time for the same settings for everybody. The x-axis, measures diversity because what it does is measures the, per, the percentage of robots that would that converge to selecting method one versus method two. We gave them here only two methods to select between for their avoidance. So if everybody, this is a perfectly homogeneous swarm on this side where everybody's selecting one method. This is a perfectly homogeneous swarm where everybody selects a different method. And this is how most experiments in this area of foraging that have been done now for a good 30 years have been carried out. You place, you put a homogeneous swarm, everybody's selecting the same method when they collide. And the big fight is over which method is best. And what it turns out, and we now know
So here the robots, the cool thing from a roboticist perspective is that they're really just, it's, it's completely it's miserable strong. for them. They don't know, they don't know and they can't know anything about how many pucks the other robots have collected. They don't need to know about what's your status. They're just looking at how much time has passed since the last collision and how much time did they spend on a collision. And those two factors are completely mm -hmm. measurable with them. So it's very, very practical from a They're robotic bad. perspective. Yes. Uh, also with this, this work on um, bandits for, for swarm and pot collection. So if each um, robot is updating its own like, just the estimate and like updating its policy over time, how do you deal with non-stationarity with the multi-agent interaction? Uh, it's a terrific question. We don't know. <laughs> We've tried, they're, they're smart, smart. So it's in general suffer from the problem where they make the assumption that the distribution is stationary. And when you apply to multiple agents, it's not stationary if only for the fact that the other robots are robots are also in the beginning. We've tried the same reward with uh, DUCB, which is discounted UCB, which is intended for non-stationary. It doesn't do as well. In fact, it does much worse. We've, there's something interesting here that works. And I don't have a good explanation for why it works. And that's kind of the next thing is to try to either be able to prove it should converge or because we have the empirical, you know, sightings, but we don't have the, the guarantees. And I don't know why it, it sort of deals with that non-stationarity of the different agents uh, there so well. It really does. Can I ask a second question? Yes, of course. So then, um, what, are, what is your action space over the arms? Is it some discretized uh, avoidance? Pause yeah. Or no, no, you, it's discrete. But then, do you, there, is there any way that you transfer information? So, like, a, if two seconds is really good, then three seconds is probably going to be better than like eight seconds. No, 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 no. There, we give them uh, a set of discrete actions okay. that are completely fixed and param you know they don't even have a con they have continuous parameters, but we fix it. So these are discrete actions, and that's in fact we were led into this because I thought we had all things solved. And the next thing to do is continuous actions. And then we tried it and just failed completely. And that <laughs> led to a reanalysis where we find errors in proofs and things like that. And so thank you. Still, still very much on the to-do plate. Okay, I'm gonna finish with this. Um, so this is uh, Asimov meets uh, molecular robots. And this is work from about eight years ago, um, maybe less, six years ago. So I'm talking about molecular robots that are this size, so tens or hundreds of nanometers in scale. Just to, again, just to give the perspective, perspective right, uh, I did from a COVID perspective. So the COVID virus is on that scale. And in fact, some of the robots that we work with are smaller. And this is a good example of one. This, I should say up front, I did not build these robots. We used them in experiments because I had in terrific collaborators. Uh, to work with, which unfortunately then left university and went on to save the world, or they're trying to save the world, for a pharmaceutical company that they founded. Uh, this is Dobacelet. But in the meantime, until they were able to go save the world, it you know, helped my career along. So uh, we're looking at uh, a technique called DNA origami, in which you can actually build 3D structures from DNA, and they can be dynamic. That is, they can change shape. Um, so all of this is really folded DNA that's hybridized to itself to form what they call the clamshell. Um, and it has two states. It can be closed and it can be open. And the difference between them is the gate. So it has these two arms that you can see here when it's closed. And when these two arms are hybridized, so they match their DNA segments, they release the structure and it would open up. And the way it was built was to do targeted drug delivery. So the idea is that you can put very toxic drugs inside the payload. It's protected from the body by the DNA enclosure. And when it reaches the target, it will open up and then release the drug right next to where it's intended to go. So that was the thought. But we were looking at this. Ido came to my room and said, I'm interested. I think I built a robot. So I'm interested in looking at this in robotics. And this is what let us started. Um, so if you think about it from a computer science perspective, this is an if-then statement. Each robot is asking a single if-then statement. It has an and in it, right? If this arm and this arm are true, then payload. And you can chain these to cause very complex cascading effects. In fact, as long as you agree that not all of them are the same asking the same question, that would be silly. But there is, you know, the we we are think we're used to thinking about the Turing machine as being the most common, you know, 
how we think about computation. But there are other competing models that all have the same power. One of them is production systems, where it's a bunch of rules that asks if then questions, who's cascading through these rules would actually create different results depending on what you know the system is actually the input that was actually given to the system. So this is the way I think about this: is we have these trillions of nanobots who are statistically then are the embodiment of, I don't know how many, but we can decide on this. That's actually the computational question. Rules, if then rules. And we can chain these in interesting ways to create a computational program that's embodied in DNA. So this is a nanobot swarm or a nanobot cocktail. And in order to show the importance of diversity in this, so in this effect of cascade, what we wanted to do was recreate Asimov's laws in molecular robots. Now I should say something. Whenever, when I started this research with Ido, you know, he's the biologist, he came up with this. I was like, oh, I can't believe they do this. They can fold DNA, something this small. They can ask if then statement. You know, I was like a kid feeling very, very stupid with uh, the incredible biologist. I just want to say for the sake of the computer scientists in the crowd that we've regained our um, honor when Ido said that he believed that all of robot, you know, this is what AI is trying to do is solve Asimov's laws. And he was convinced that we had a big breakthrough because we were able to do Asimov's laws. And then I had to show him the, the work that was being carried out in robotics and AI. You know, this is a literary device and it's fascinating, but it's not really, you know, not to be taken too seriously with scientific. But it is a great philosophical device to thinking about complexity. So here's how we do this. We create three robots. Okay, the first robot, which we call L1, will check for harm. I mean, these are the, the rules that, um, that Asimov wrote, right? The robot will not harm a human being. We're going to create a robot that can stop tasks from being carried out. And I'll, I'll discuss this. Second robot will do the second law, which is the robot will do as commanded unless it's instructed to close, right? And this is being shut down by the by law one. And the third robot, the third law is the robot will protect itself. And that has a special meaning in our setting. So as I said, this is a literary device, but it's been used again and again to sort of promote thinking about philosophical issues. So you do this by reordering how you think about the rules. You build a robot that does something. That's your L2, okay? It carries out the command that you've been, that it's been given. Could be harmful or it could be benevolent. You don't know. Then you build another robot that can shut down the other robots. That's the L1 robot. And it responds to harm. And we did this by looking at a particular molecule called MIR, which is intracellular. That is normally would be inside cells, but when cells break down, it gets released into the bloodstream. And this in fact is one of the mechanisms by which the body actually detects damage. And it's part of the mechanisms that cause you pain because cells are breaking down. That's literally the biological definition of harm or a biological definition of harm. Okay, and the body does respond to it. So this is um, how we discover that there's harm being carried out. And then the L3 was a special kind of, it really wasn't a robot, but a special kind of mechanism that was allowed the L1 and L2s to work, but only if they were in particular ratio, which we have empirically uh, determined what to be. So the L3s were there to make sure that there's enough L1s for the L2s and vice versa because otherwise they really set the priority because without them, what you would have is an L2 that maybe is causing damage to the L1. So it kills its own police, right? Its own protectors. Um, so this is what you have to do. And the, the, the whole thing together, each one of them is asking a simple if state statement. The whole thing together actually carries out the three rules. And, and to show this, you know, this is how you would think about them. And you know what, for the sake of time, let's just skip this. But the whole thing uh, works together and we have more in the paper that shows uh, the actual DNA segments and so forth. But in order to do this, we recreated one of Asimov's original stories. Actually, this is the runaround is a very famous story because that was the first time he actually introduced all the three laws of robotics. And it was also known for where the three laws of robotics actually work, but still things go haywire. And um, it's terrific reading. I'm just gonna do, but I have to do a spoiler because otherwise I can't tell you. So. Very quickly, it's a story about a robot called Speedy. It's on um, Mercury and um, it's very hot. So it can go on the surface, but the humans that are there can't. 
and they sent it to select uh, to bring selenium and they a few hours later they found out that he's running around that's why the i have the title of the story and later on they to try to assess what's going on it turns out that the robot was giving very casually instruction to bring selenium um and the selenium is inside this uh, pond of toxic materials that would actually kill the robot. So it reached a balancing, a tipping point, exactly where it's getting close to the selenium because it's commanded to, but then it wants to save itself because of the third law. So it runs around like this. And they try different things, and the only way to break the equilibrium, and Isaac Asimov, this is 40s, and he's, this is a problem that really happens if you do potential field robotics. So <laughs> this is serious. Uh, he's predicted it. Uh, the only the way that it gets resolved is one of the human risking itself, which now triggers the first law. So it gets it out of the equilibrium, okay? So we've done this in a test tube. Um, what you're seeing here is the, uh, uh, this me measures fluorescence, but essentially it measures the number of robots that are active, okay? Um, and so it starts by the L2 robots working and then, they, because they're, they're working by reducing the number of L1s. And so it actually, the L3s now kick in and say, no, 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 you've got too many, the balance is shifting. So um, this is now kicking in, so it stops this. So now they become, they reach an equilibrium point. So now we introduced the harm molecule, which triggers the L1s, and then that stops the L2s from working altogether and hits the equilibrium, you know, a new equilibrium where the other one just overrides the entire system. Yeah, and I think this is it. Okay. This is the uh, summary slide. Questions? Yes. Um, maybe this is just a conversation for later, but like it seems like there's something implicit about especially in this last project, there's almost a social hierarchy where like <laughs> L3, like, yeah, I guess I'm not sure if you've thought about it like that. Like, I, know I don't, I wouldn't call it hierarchy. Okay. It, there's domination because there's a, there's an internal priority, but that's what you need in order for the three R laws to work in their given priority. Yeah. I, guess, I was just curious if you've thought about social hierarchy at all. Like I know this comes up in ant mm, colonies. And yeah, no, I try to, I'm, I'm very anti -system. I'm a department chair that is putting in a bureaucracy into my own department because we don't have one. And I keep confounding myself with this because I really hate bureaucracy. <laughs> so I'm not very good at thinking about hierarchies. Yes, Ariel. I was curious, uh, for the second part of the test again, is uh, why stochastic gains is the right formalism? So in particular, where, where does the randomness in positions come, come from? Is it from uncertainty of the execution of the robots or somewhere else? Yeah. So, the quick answer is that different combinations of these actions are really different games. So each one of us is selecting a different uh, an avoidance action, right? And then um, that will create a new, essentially that's a new game. That selection by itself, it's, it's not just a different, it's in the joint action. It also creates different rewards. And so the reward that you get for that selection keeps changing. But you're thinking about the deterministic transition function to a different game. Yeah. Yeah, and we haven't modeled that probability. So for now, we're still assuming that it's uniform probability. You can just transition from any game to any other game. That's not true, but work in progress. Okay, great. Let's thank the speaker again. Uh, we will be having lunch with Gal Downsides at the SEC Cafe at 1 p.m. So if you have more questions, please join us. Uh, and our next speaker will be on October 17th. It will be Dr. Nilo Pertalehi from UC Berkeley uh, talking about how theories of justice can inform the design of computational systems. And, and lastly, you. and maybe most importantly, if you haven't gotten lunch vouchers, please take them on your way out. Yeah. Yes.